you've got your Bibles, let's turn to John, Gospel of John, chapter 1. And as you're doing that, let me ask you a question. How many of you guys know what this is? We'll put it up on the screen for you. It's a picture. How many of y'all know what that is? Raise your hand. What's that called? The Leaning Tower of Pisa. I know our radio and podcast listeners cannot see it, but it's a familiar image, isn't it? Uh, I think they can picture it in their mind. We've all at one point in time or another seen the Leaning Tower of Pisa. How many of you have seen it in person? Few of you, not not all of us, but uh, a few of us have seen it in person. It's famous, isn't it? It's, It's famous. That's why we all know what it is. You know what makes it famous? The fact that it's leaning. It's really not that impressive of a structure other than the fact that it's leaning. If it wasn't leaning, you and I probably wouldn't even know about it. We certainly wouldn't know about it to the degree we do today. Isn't it crazy how how its flaw is what makes it famous? What's wrong with it is what makes us all know what it is. One of of the most interesting things to me about the Leaning Tower of Pisa, or just the Tower of Pisa, as it was supposed to be called, is the fact that they knew it was leaning, and they kept building it. I believe it started in 1172, if, if memory serves me correct, And they recognized that it was leaning in 1178 when they were about to start the third story. They noticed that the foundation had started to give on one side and it wasn't true anymore. In fact, because of that, they redesigned it and they came in and mathematicians and architects did what they do. And they decided they were going to put more weight on the other side. They were going to change the height of the wall so there would be more weight on the side that was needed more weight on it in hopes to get it to stop leaning. It didn't work. It'd be another 200 years before they would actually complete the tower, not just because it was leaning and that created difficulties with its building, but there were wars and financial problems for the government and other things that happened during those 200 years. But Even though it was leaning, they kept on building it. The poor foundation of the structure is the problem. It's it's too soft. They didn't go down deep enough when they put the foundation in. And in 1990, the tower got to where it was leaning over five and a half degrees. And engineers and architects and people that do these kinds of things had determined that it was only a matter of time before it fell and crumbled to the ground. They closed it down. They did a major restoration project in the 1990s. And after spending all that money and doing all that work, now it only leans four degrees. (laughs) They got it pulled back over just enough to where it's now stable It's still sinking a little bit on that side, but not near as fast and near as much. And they believe it'll be stable for at least another 200 years uh, at the rate that it is now. But the craziest thing to me is they knew it was leaning and they just kept on building it. They just kept on going. And you're probably wondering, why is he telling us this at Christmas? What in the world... Does the leaning tower of Pisa have to do with Jesus or Christmas? Well, I think it's a good example of what many Christians do with the holiday we call Christmas. And what many Christians do with Jesus as well. Again, I'm not, I'm not talking about the world. I'm not talking about lost people. I'm talking about the church. I'm talking about people who claim to be disciples of Jesus Christ. The reality is, is many Christians have a faulty foundation when it comes to Christmas. Don't don't even get me started on Santa Claus and the elf on the shelf. Um, I know I'm an old fuddy-duddy, but but all that nonsense, combined with all the commercialization of everything Christmas, has created a soft foundation 
in the lives of many believers. There's, a, there's another major issue, I believe, in the church and with Christians and those of us who've grown up in church. And, and that is this, we, we place so much of an emphasis on the Christmas story that we read in Matthew and Luke that we miss what is perhaps the purest and perhaps the best Christmas story in the Gospels over here in the Gospel of John. Matthew starts off with this epic genealogy followed by angels and wise men and a trip to the temple, a flight and an escape to Egypt. Finally, they get back to Nazareth. Luke does much the same with his gospel. But John, John starts with these words in John 1.1. 1, 1. He says, in the beginning was the word... And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, please hear me. Matthew and Luke have their place. I'm grateful. I'm thankful. I'm, I'm, I'm extremely enamored with the details that they share in their gospel. I'm glad those details are there. I'm glad we know that there was no room in the inn. I'm glad we know Jesus was born in a manger. I'm glad we know about the wise men and the star. I, I'm, I'm glad we know about all those details surrounding the birth of Jesus. But the reality is, is the Christmas story for us as Christians, many times those things become the focus of the Christmas story in our minds. It's angels and miracles and overcoming obstacles. It's shepherds. It's a wicked king. Oh, yeah, and a baby named Jesus. But John starts his gospel with these 14 verses that will firm up your Christmas foundation really, really quick if you pay attention to them. Here's what he says. Let's read these 14 verses. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through Him, and apart from Him, not one thing was created that has been created. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was created through him, and yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born not of natural descent or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, God with us. We observed his glory. The glory is the one and only son from the father, full of grace and truth. If you turn over to Revelation 19, you'll see Jesus referred to once again as the Word of God, starting in verse 11, it says, Then I saw heaven opened, and there was a white horse. Its rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a fiery flame, and many crowns were on his head. He had a name written that no one knows except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The armies that were in heaven followed him on white horses wearing pure white linen. A sharp sword came from his mouth so that he might strike the nations with it. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will also trample the wine presses of the fierce anger of God, the Almighty. And he has a name written on his robe and on his thigh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. My big idea for you today is this. The one thing I want you to remember and the one thing I want to submit to you and make sure you grab 
It's that the foundation of Christmas is not our family gatherings. The foundation of Christmas is not amazing food that's going to pack extra pounds on us before we start our New Year's resolutions. The foundation of Christmas is not the presents under the tree. It's not an elf on a shelf that magically flies around your house causing and wreaking havoc. It's not shepherds or wise men. The foundation of Christmas is not a manger. It's not prophets. It's not a virgin or angels. No, the foundation of Christmas is Jesus. The big idea is this, the flesh of God is the foundation of Christmas. The flesh of God who came and dwelt among us. I think at some level we all know that, we just don't live like it. And we just keep on year after year, kind of like they did with the leaning tower of Pisa, we just keep building on top of something that's already leaning and a little out of square. And we just keep putting more and more on top of a weak foundation. And as we continue to do that, it just grows ever closer to crumbling down. There's so much we could say about these 14 verses in the Gospel of John, but I want to give you just three, the three things that I think are most important to our foundation of Christmas. The first can be described with the word pre-existence. You need to know, John wants you to know, that Jesus has always been and will always be. You have to believe in and and know the reality of the pre-existence of Jesus. Jesus was not created. Jesus was not invented. Jesus was not an afterthought. He is God in the flesh, and he was sent to rescue and redeem humanity. This is why John says in his very first verse, the very first words, he launches off into his gospel with this, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. In the beginning, from the very start was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. The flesh of God is the foundation of Christmas. And he always has been and always will be. If you look down into John chapter 8 and flip over a few pages, starting in verse 58, John says this, recording some words of Christ, Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, before Abraham was... I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus was hidden, it says, and went out of the temple. Jesus himself says, before Abraham was, I am. And instead of that getting the Jews excited in a good way, going, hey, this must be God with us. This is God in the flesh. They decided, hey, let's pick up some stones and kill this guy. Because it made them mad. It made them mad that Jesus would claim to have been pre-existent, to have always been. And there are many today, church, there are many in in even mainstream so-called Christian churches, which I believe are actually false religions, who teach that Jesus is not pre-existent. You can read their theology, you can read their works. You can read the things their leaders have written. And they will tell you things like this. Jesus is a spirit child created by God. A spirit child who is the first of many spirit children. Or that Jesus was God's plan B. He was an afterthought that God invented later on to fix a mess that God had not anticipated. Or that Jesus was just a man like you or like me that God put a special anointing on for a special time and for a special purpose. Or that Jesus was a prophet who was ordained by God to bring a a special message to earth of love and peace and grace. Guys, these are not hidden people 
off in the far off mountains that you've never heard of. These are places and denominations and people who have churches in our town who teach this kind of thing about Jesus that he did not pre-exist or some other kind of nonsense like that that denies and diminishes or flat out dismisses the reality that John professes and proclaims at the start of his gospel that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. If you don't have the pre-existence of Jesus in your foundation, church, your tower is going to lean. If you don't have the pre-existence of Jesus firmed up in your foundation, your tower is going to crumble. If you don't have the pre-existence of Jesus firmly implanted in your foundation, I'll just say it, you're flat out wrong. Jesus himself said it. In John chapter 17, verse 5, we get these words. They are in red. They are the words of Christ. He says, now, Father, glorify me in your presence with that glory I had with you before the world existed. Now, I don't know about you, I'm not a real smart guy, but that sounds pretty pre-existent to me. Before the world existed. Paul said it like this in Colossians 1, 15 through 17. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, All things have been created through him and for him. And then he says, he is before all things, and by him all things are held together. Everything is created by him, everything is created for him, and everything is created through him. He is before it all, he is over it all, he is in it all. That sounds pretty pre-existent to me. The writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. How can he be that if he's not preexistent? In the first epistle of John, we get this testimony in 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. I want you to see John is driving this home, man. He says, what was from the beginning? What we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have observed and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. That life was revealed and we have seen it and we testify and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. What we have seen and heard, we also declare to you so that you may also have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We're writing these things so that our joy may be complete. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen, what we know, this is Jesus. From the beginning, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. His pre-existence is important And it's absolutely unquestionable. He always has been and always will be. You can go all the way to the last chapter of the Bible and read these words in red from Jesus himself. Revelation 22, 12. Look, I'm coming soon and my reward is with me to repay each person according to his work. And then he says this in verse 13. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. The flesh of God is the foundation of Christmas, and indeed the foundation of everything. I know what you're thinking, well, is this really that important? (laughs) Yeah, it is. I love what John MacArthur said about it. He put it like this, if Jesus is pre-existent, then he is not a part of creation. If he is pre-existent, he is outside of creation, and he is before time. And if he is outside of creation and before time, then he is eternal. And if he is eternal, then he is God. You see, if Jesus did not pre-exist, if he has not always been and will not always be, if he is indeed just one of many spirit children that God has created, 
then he can't be God, can he? And he can't be your savior. He cannot be your redeemer. He cannot be your rescuer. So yeah, it matters whether or not he is preexistent. And whether or not you put that in your foundation. And if you don't, I'm telling you, your tower is going to lean. Look at verse 2. John goes on. He doesn't just say he's pre-existent. In verse 2, we learn that he is co-existent with God. Verse 2. He was with God in the beginning. So again, we see the beginning, but we don't need to cover that again. The pre-existence, I think we covered that thoroughly. But we see that he was with God in the beginning. So he not only pre-existed, but he coexisted with God. He's not a competitor to God. He's not a better or a lesser version or form of God. He's not a creation of God. He's not a messenger or a prophet from God. He coexists with God from the beginning. He is God, which is why I remind you once again, the flesh of God is the foundation of Christmas. Go back up to verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. You see how John is really driving this home? Because it's important to our faith and the foundation of it. And he's not alone. In Colossians it says this, Colossians 1, 19 through 20, For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. All the fullness of God dwelled in him. He coexisted with God. Colossians 2, 9 and 10, for the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ. How much clearer can it be for us? And then he goes on and says, and you have been filled by him who is the head over every ruler and authority. You see, Jesus is God. The entire fullness of God dwells in him. He is 100% coexistent with God. I know we've already looked at it once, but look again at John 17, 5, if you would. Again, these are the words of Jesus. Now, Father, glorify me in your presence with that glory I had with you before the world existed. Jesus was being glorified in the presence of God before the world existed. He is worthy of honor. He is worthy of praise. He is worthy of worship because he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords because he is God. And he was with us in the flesh. Let me just share one more amazing verse with you before we move on. It comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, verse 21, where it says this, When all the people were baptized, Jesus also was baptized as he was praying, heaven opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in a physical appearance like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. And here is what the voice said, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. I want you to see this because once again we see that Jesus and God are coexistent in relationship with one another. This is why Jesus says over and over and over again throughout his ministry that he came to glorify the Father. He doesn't just pre-exist with God, he coexists with God. You have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit who make up the Holy Trinity, which all coexist in absolute unity. The flesh of God is the foundation of Christmas. And if you don't put his pre-existence and his coexistence in your foundation, your tower is going to lean and one day crumble and fall. There's one final thing that John drives home that we'll close with today, and that is the self-existence of Jesus. He does not just pre-exist. He does not just coexist. He also self-exists. Jesus does not depend on, nor does he need, anyone for anything. 
He does not just exist. He does not just coexist or pre-exist. He is self-existing. Look at verse 4. If you want to have a strong foundation and a strong tower, you've got to catch this about Jesus. John chapter 1, verse 4, in him was life. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. In Jesus was life. He is the source, the genesis of life. He did not come to life in a manger. He did not come to life in a womb. He pre-existed, co-existed, and self-existed long before any angel ever came to visit Mary. The flesh of God is the foundation of Christmas. Jesus is life and has always been life and will always be life. Look at John chapter 5, starting in verse 25. Again, the words of Christ where he says this. He says, truly, I tell you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of God, the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live, for just as the Father has life in himself, catch it, for just as the Father has life in himself, so also he has granted to the Son to have life in himself. And he has granted him the right to pass judgment because he is the Son of Man. He has life in himself. He self-exists. You don't have that. I don't have that. My kids don't have that. I remind them of that often. I brought you into this world. I'll take you out of this world. You don't self-exist. You can't live without me. Right? You don't have it. I don't have it. They don't have it. No one you know has it. No one on this planet self-exists in and of themselves. We have life life because God lets us have life. We breathe because he lets us breathe his air. Our hearts beat because he says they can. We have life only because he gives it to us. We don't self-exist, but Jesus did. We have life because we have a good father. He had life because he is life. We have life because God is good and God is gracious towards us and God gives us the gift of life. He had life because he is the genesis of all life. He pre-existed, co-existed, and self-existed. And this got Jesus into a lot of trouble when he talked about it out loud. You can look at it in places like John chapter 7, verse 37 and 38. On the last and most important day of the festival... Jesus stood up and he cried out, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. The one who believes in me, as the scripture has said, will have what? He will have streams of living water flow from deep within him. He says he will have life. Jesus said, if you want to have life, you're going to have to come get it from me because I am life. He says it even clearer in John chapter 11, verse 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And then he asked her the question, do you believe this? Do you believe I'm the source of life, that I self-exist? Or you can look at John chapter 14, verses 6 and 7. They get quoted a lot. Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will also know my Father. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. There is no life outside of Christ. Paul said it like this in Colossians 3, 1 and 4. So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. He says, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, he says, then you also will appear with him in glory. See, you don't self-exist. 
Your life comes through his life. Christ is your life. To the Galatians, he said this in chapter 2, verses 19 and 20, For through the law I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. He's the source of the life inside of him. He says, the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, the source of life, who loved me and gave himself for me. Peter, in Acts chapter 3, is rebuking the people of Jerusalem for what they did to Jesus. And he says these most profound and pointed words. He says, you killed the source of of life in Acts 3 verse 15. He says, you killed the source, you murdered the source of life whom God raised from the dead. We are witnesses of this. You killed the source of life. Or you can look at this little tiny detail in a place here in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 1. It's in the greeting that Paul gives and it's this little detail, gets skipped over a lot, but we see this pattern even here in this greeting. 2 Timothy 1.1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will for the sake of the promise of life in Christ Jesus. The source of life. What I'm trying to show you is this. There is a very clear and a very consistent and a very compelling pattern all throughout Scripture that Jesus is life. That life is found in Christ. That he is the source and the genesis of life. He didn't just pre-exist and coexist; He self-exists. Look at, look at this last one with me. It comes from 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 through 13. He says, and this is the testimony. He doesn't say this is a testimony or this is part of the testimony. He says, this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in who? His Son. This life is in Jesus, the source of it. The one who has the Son has life. The one who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Even somebody like me can understand that. You don't have life if you don't have Jesus. He says, I've written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have what? Eternal life. Did you hear that? This life is in the Son of God. The one who has the Son has life. The one who does not have the Son does not have life. Don't miss that this Christmas. In the middle of all the noise, in the middle of all the nonsense, in the middle of the crowds and the chaos, don't miss the truth. Don't miss the most important thing. That God came to be with us. That the flesh of God is the foundation of Christmas. Jesus, the one who pre-existed, co-exists, and self-exists, came to earth, the flesh of God, lived for you, died for you, and then rose from the grave for you, to rescue you and to redeem you and to restore you into a right relationship with God. Yet because many have such a soft malleable foundation when it comes to Christmas. Many today still don't believe this. Sadder still, there are many who still live in fear of God rather than in a relationship with God. Maybe that's you. Maybe today you're scared of God. Maybe you don't want to get too close to Him. I want to read to you from a devotional resource that I send out each quarter to our radio listeners and to people who support Pastor Pete Ministries. It was written months ago, almost a full year ago. Had no idea I was preaching on this text today. 
But in today's devotion, there's a quote from Philip Yancey, which says this, Certainly the Jews associated fear with worship. A person blessed with a direct encounter with God expected to come away scorched or glowing or maybe half crippled like Jacob. Among people who walled off a separate sanctum for God in the temple and shrank from pronouncing or spelling out the name of God, God made a surprise appearance as a baby in a manger. In Jesus, God found a way of relating to human beings that did not involve fear. A new covenant. A new covenant that would not emphasize the gulf between God and humanity, but instead would span it. I learned about incarnation when I kept a saltwater aquarium. You would think, in view of all the energy expended on their behalf, that my fish would at least be grateful. No. Not so. Every time my shadow loomed over the tank, they dove for cover. To them, I was deity. Too large for them. My actions too incomprehensible. My acts of mercy, they saw as cruelty. My attempts at healing, they saw as destruction. To change their perceptions, I would have to become a fish and speak to them a language they could understand. A human being becoming a fish is nothing compared to God becoming a baby. Yet that is what happened at Bethlehem. The God who created matter took shape within it as an artist might become a spot on a painting. God wrote a story only using real characters on the pages of real history. Indeed, the Word became flesh. Church, you need not fear God. He loves you, cares for you, died for you, sent His Son to walk among us so you could see and experience him in a way that you could understand and relate to. And the truth of the matter is, if you will repent of your sins and call on him as your Lord and Savior this hour, you will be saved. Not by me, not by this church, not by your works, not by your will, not by anything you've earned or deserved or ever will earn or deserve, but you will be saved by the grace of God. The one who pre-existed, co-exists, and self-exists. Repent of your sins. Call on him as your Lord and Savior this hour. Be saved this day. The flesh of God is the foundation of Christmas. Let's pray. If that's you and you have never given your life to the Lord, we invite you to do so this morning. You can pray with us in the stillness of your heart. You need not walk an aisle or come to the front. Just say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up and gone astray. So I ask now by faith that you would change me. Lord, I ask by faith that you would forgive me. I ask by faith that you would save me. Make me new. Wash me clean. Redeem me and make me whole as only you can do. Lord, I thank you for your grace and for your mercy and for your peace. I thank you for coming to be with us in the flesh. I thank you for Christmas and for the cross. Lord, as we close this hour, we are reminded of that final verse in the text we camped out on today. Verse 14 the word became flesh and dwelt among us, praise God. We observed his glory, the glory as the one and only son from the father, full of grace and full of truth. Lord, not all of our houses are full of presents, not all of our hearts are full of joy. 
Not all of our worlds and lives are full of peace. But Father, I pray this Christmas we would be full of grace and truth. Lord, I pray our cups would overflow as we recall, as we remember, and as we rejoice in the fact that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, that you came to be with us. That is the greatest gift of all. That is the best peace of all. Help us to firm up our foundations if our tower is leaning and to remember what Christmas is all about. Lord, as we prepare now to take part in the Lord's Supper, as we remember your blood and the new covenant and your flesh and your sacrifice, Lord, help us. Help us to embrace it, to remember it, and to honor you with it. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen.